Okay, here we go. Now we come to the panel that I was the most excited about. And anyone who knows me will probably know why. This panel is, of course, The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies, the third film in the Hobbit trilogy, and the supposed final piece of the six-film series that Peter Jackson has has uh, developed for for uh, Tolkien's works, the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. Hosting it was actually Stephen Colbert, which, you know, that's actually pretty appropriate because Stephen Colbert is a huge Tolkien fan. I mean, I mean, I thought I was, I mean, stupid me, or or naive me. I thought I was was really big into Tolkien. No, Stephen Colbert, he knows all of the terms, he knows all of the the geography, he knows the languages, he knows the different classes of each race. I mean, he is like, I mean, he is like a walking source of knowledge on on Tolkien lore. Okay, and that is no bad thing. Um, <clears throat> so, so he he was actually serving as the moderator for this. Again, you can tell that uh, that I really like the fact that they got Stephen Colbert to do this because he's someone who, like I said, really understands and respects the material. Um, not not just the the written material, but also the the very faithful and very uh, inspired movie adaptations. So, so he was the moderator, and attending it was uh, Peter Jackson, of course, Philip Aboyans, uh, co-writer, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, Kate Blanchett, uh, Orlando Bloom, Evangeline Lilly, uh, Luke Evans, Lee Pace, Graham McTavish, Elijah Wood, Andy Serkis. I believe that was it. But uh, sadly, no Martin Freeman, no Richard Armitage, and no Ian McKellen. Because they were uh, they were off doing, they were busy, is is what it amounts to. <clears throat> if if I'm not mistaken, Ian McKellen is currently working on on an adaptation of Sherlock Holmes, which actually would have made for a potentially interesting repertoire between him and Cumberbatch. But you know, I I digress. That's just me thinking out loud. Um, and really, this panel this panel did not really focus on the third Hobbit movie by itself as much as I thought it would. Um, again, me being naive, I, th I thought they would just purely talk about the movie and what it was like shooting it, maybe talk about talk about their experiences shooting The Hobbit, but no, in fact, in fact it was a much, uh, it was a much broader range of questions in terms of, in terms of what these, uh, these people were asked about. A lot of the questions actually had to do with the with you know what was their mindset going in? How did they, how did they transition into into these roles? Uh, <clears throat> did they ever did they ever really predict that these films would become as successful as they were? How did it really really redefine the fantasy genre? How it garnered new respect for uh, at least in the mainstream for uh, for the works of Tolkien and fantasy in general? How it how it actually influenced uh, several pieces of several pieces of uh, entertainment and pop culture afterwards um, all of which are all of which are true I mean even even good pieces of entertainment you can definitely see see uh, essence of Lord of the Rings as it were at least the movie adaptations in these uh, in these works and I'm not just talking about the Chronicles of Narnia movies I'm talking about uh, Harry Potter Harry Potter particularly the final Harry Potter movie the Battle of Hogwarts um, and even Game of Thrones, I mean, a lot of aspects of Game of Thrones are really reminiscent of Lord of the Rings. Obviously, a lot more uh, risque in terms of in terms of uh, content, but but you see my point. So so after a while, I was I was sort of accepting over over uh, not necessarily having the questions be solely focused on the film, the Battle of the Five Armies, which you know I should I should tackle. An elephant in the room, or at least a mental elephant in the room that is that has been kind of festering in my head for a while, which is that it's going to take some time for me to get used to the title. I'm sorry, I I was perfectly fine with the first title that they had, which was The Hobbit: Colon There and Back Again. Okay, that that just seemed like like such a great bookend to the whole thing. 
um, because because you know they are there and and back again just seemed like a, a natural progression. Not to mention it's a it's a popular phrase in in Tolkien's works. So so when they decided to, to change it to the Hobbit, the Battle of the Five Armies, yeah, you could still tell it's one of Tolkien's titles, but but it just didn't really seem as appropriate for an ending title as there and back again. However, a title doesn't really do anything to ruin a movie for me. I didn't really like the title to Pacific Rim, but, but you know, Pacific Rim was still an enjoyable movie. But uh, one thing I really liked about, about this panel in general and, and the approach to it is that you can tell every single one of these actors really cared about the material, really cared about making, making something really special really uh they were i think they were all taken aback by not just the success of the movies but how but how um the lord of the rings movies influenced film in general and kind of what it was like trying to step back into that and trying to and trying to tell not just a prequel story but actually but actually uh do right by tolkien and you know how do you go about the hobbit because they're because the lord of the rings um is the Lord of the Rings there there's a lot uh, less there's a lot less that you have to do in terms of uh, getting creative with how to structure things. The Lord of the Rings um, is is fairly straightforward in in comparison to what the Hobbit later became in Tolkien's in uh, Tolkien's writings because basically basically the Lord of the Rings are just told in that straightforward fashion. I mean I mean beginning, middle and chronological order. I mean obviously you have they're kind of split between between uh, the exploits of several different characters, but but the Hobbit was actually written. The original story was actually written before before Tolkien had mapped out anything in Middle Earth, um, and then afterwards, after writing the Lord of the Rings in the appendices, he actually went back and uh, and filled in several of the holes in in his original Hobbit story and kind of made it more in line with um, with his Lord of the Rings movies. So. So in that sense, so in that sense, there was a lot less, uh, there was a lot more. Um, um, I'm trying, I'm trying to think of the phrase. There was a lot more that they had to do in terms of uh, structuring the the whole thing than they than they could with the Lord of the Rings because because like I said, the Lord of the Rings already has a preset structure. The Hobbit, there's really uh, there's really a lot more freedom, I think. In how you want to structure it. Do you want to? I mean, do you want to focus on on the dwarves here? Do you want to focus on Bard here? Do you want to focus on Gandalf and, and uh, the White Council here? <clears throat> so, so there's that, and all, and there's also the interesting uh, issue of tone, which was addressed by uh, by Colbert himself. And again, I think I think having Colbert as as the moderator for this actually actually proved to be an advantage because this is someone who has who has loved the works of Tolkien for most of his life. I mean, he, he's just as much a fan as as any of us, if not m much more so. I mean, he is he is he's is, he's obviously very passionate about this material and just and to have him as the moderator again, not to hit the nail on the head too many times, I think seemed very appropriate. And when he brought up the issue of tone and you know and you know how the Hobbit, the original Hobbit book, was much more lighthearted, and how they were going to to tonally transition to the Lord of the Rings. Peter Jackson basically said that from the beginning, or at least from the beginning of shooting the Hobbit movies, he he really wanted to have this tonal transition um, over the three movies to eventually where it is in Fellowship of the Ring, because because the Lord of the Rings, the tone, even the books, um, the tone of the books is a lot more gloom and doom. Than, than the Hobbit. I mean, there's there's a uh, you're talking about you're talking about uh, potentially destroying the world in the Lord of the Rings. In the Hobbit, it's about getting some treasure and slaying a dragon. I mean, typical fantasy stuff. Um, it just happened to be done really well. Um, so yeah, there always was this very interesting uh, issue with tone and and actually having this gradual progression and actually. Ha having Peter Jackson talk about the gradual progression of, of tone was, was pretty interesting because it actually made a lot of sense for Unexpected Journey to be very, uh, to be, to be very comedic and lighthearted and, uh, and fun 
and then Desolation of Smaug, you went you went darker, and then the Battle of Five Armies is is going to be really emotional and hard hitting, and uh, and actually will pave the way and and uh, and make for a smoother transition to the very uh, to the very somber, very very foreboding tone and atmosphere of the Fellowship of the Ring. So so um, so as a from a critical standpoint, I actually thought that made a lot of sense. <clears throat> Because the Lord of the Rings, there is even a sense of escalation, and to, and to actually continue that sense of escalation, and honestly bridge the tonal gap between the two trilogies is a is a pretty interesting idea. Um, and also, and also they were confronted with the issue of killing off uh, several characters in this in this movie, which you know if you've read The Hobbit, um, you you probably know who's going to get killed off. What actually shocked me is that, uh, if memory serves, they actually killed off more dwarves in the animated Rankin Bass movie than than in, were killed off in the source material in the, in the book. So I just thought that was kind of uh, kind of odd, considering how how cheesy the the Rankin Bass movie is. But you know, I'm getting off topic here. The trailer the trailer itself actually looked really awesome, it, and. To be honest, I was getting a little worried for, for a while there. I was getting a little worried about, you know, are they going to have to postpone um, the movie again to the summer of 2016, or, or not 20, 2015, um, because there has not been a trailer, and if memory serves, we usually had, we had a trailer for the next movie by, by this point for the previous two films. Um, but they did show a trailer, and, uh, and it's this... Honestly, honestly, I really get the sense that they're saving saving most of the footage of Smaug attacking Lake Town for the actual film, or or at least a trailer that uh, premieres closer to the film. <clears throat> Maybe to kind of keep it in shadow. Maybe they just don't want to play their hand too early. A lot of the trailer was just kind of preparing for battle, preparing for the uh, for the battle in the title, the titular battle, the battle of the five armies, because because Bard is shown and Friendwheel is shown. They're shown kind of forming this alliance, kind of going up to Thorin and saying, will you choose peace or war? And Thorin and his army of dwarves said, basically say, we will choose war. And throughout the whole trailer, it's this very somber trailer. I was actually surprised at how, at how emotionally hard-hitting it was. Um, it's, this very, um, it's this very somber music, and I said, I recognize that. Where do I recognize that? And it's actually... It's actually the song that Pippin sings in the Return of the King movie when he's uh, when he's under the service of Denethor. It's that really somber music that plays when Faramir tries to retake Osgiliath. Um, they play that all throughout the trailer. Uh, all shall fade. So, actually, no. I think the song is called Edge of Night. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. What matters is was it appropriate? I think so, especially given how how grim things are about to get. And I always think that was going to be, I think that was always going to be the case with the Battle of the Five Armies, because you can't have a battle of five armies without without taking some heavy casualties on each side. So, see, so yeah, I thought the trailer was very appropriate for what we are eventually going to see. Um, the movie itself just looks gorgeous. I mean, the landscapes, the, the sets, the costumes, um, the, the, uh, the CGI, Everything just looks gorgeous. I mean, you expect Peter Jackson's movies to look look gorgeous at this point. I mean, it's it's practically a staple of his work. Um, so so I think so I think the gorgeous visuals I think will add not only to the not only to the to any potential 3D seekers out there, but also also just the grand spectacle of the whole thing. Um, and what what actually poses an interesting issue in terms of in terms of telling a cinematic narrative is actually is actually the fact that uh, Bilbo in the book is a, is knocked out. I mean, he misses the Battle of the Five Armies in the book, and on the page that works. But but in the film, you could very much run the risk of that being a little anticlimactic. So I don't really know what they're going to do with that. If they're going to have Bilbo um, kind of caught up in some of the battle, maybe on the side, maybe on the outskirts of the battle, um, and then get and then get knocked on the head, or if they're just going to ditch that idea entirely, have him participate in the battle, or at least uh, try and stay out of the battle, but inevitably have to cut down some orcs. 
on a lo along the way. I don't really know how they're going to do that. Um, but oddly enough, one omit, one glaring omission, or at least one omission that I thought was glaring from the trailer, at least, was um, was Dane. Billy Connolly. They have brought in Billy Connolly as Thorin cousin Thorin's uh, cousin Dane Ironfoot, um, which already I thought was pretty uh, pretty odd, considering how Billy Connolly does not like J.R.R. Tolkien's books. He likes the movies. He claims he likes the movies, but. Uh, but he does not like the books, so I thought that was a pretty odd thing to do. Although it does, it does show a little, an interesting bit of tolerance on Peter Jackson's part. How how you take someone who has actively, who has openly stated that he does not like the source material, and put him in an adaptation of the source material. I thought that was a really funny move. And you know, if Billy Connolly is right for the role of Dane, then I'm not going to have a problem with with whether or not he likes Tolkien or not. I mean, that's his prerogative. Um, as long as as long as the part is realized well, I I could really care less. Um, yeah, not really too much in the trailer that uh, disappointed me, aside from the fact that we barely got any anything in the way of uh, anything in the way of character interaction, or at least uh, or at least prolonged character interaction. A lot of it was very uh, a lot of it was more visual than than uh, than dialogue heavy. There wasn't really a whole lot of dialogue in the trailer. It, I mean, occasionally Bilbo would say, I'm going to remember this. I mean, someday when I'm back home, I'm going to remember this. Um, but but there wasn't really anything in terms of uh, in terms of two actors communicating with each other, having this really intimate scene. And I think that that's what, have, uh, what would have really made this more emotional than it already was. However, as the trailer as the trailer goes, I I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it really set the tone nicely. It, I didn't really think it gave too much away. Um, and if the movie itself, I'm not just talking in terms of in terms of a design standpoint. I'm talking about just the movie quality wise. It looks like it's going to be a fantastic conclusion. Everyone at the panel seemed seemed very enthusiastic. Everyone at the panel seemed very. Uh, they seemed they seemed very uh, open to put their faith in Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson, who at this point is still finishing the movie, um, and even after even after that, he's probably going to be busy with uh, the extended cut. Um, would I've liked to see to have seen a little a uh, little bit more in the way of questions about this uh, this particular film, the Battle of the Five Armies? Sure, but but. Um, I think I think talking about the whole this series as a whole was also at the same time a, a pretty logical move. I mean, especially now that everything is nearing the end, we can see the finish line, and and having everyone everyone kind of look at look back on it um, retrospectively, I actually think made a, made a whole lot of sense. Um, do I wish there was more there were more questions devoted to the Battle of the Five Armies? Probably, but. But again, I think the retrospective uh, approach that they took worked well, and again, everyone seemed happy to be there. The trailer was fantastic, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to this one. It's my most anticipated movie of the year. Not just my most anticipated thing at Comic-Con, one, one of the things I have been looking forward to all year. I mean, please, please don't drop the ball. That That is basically what I was thinking. For months, please don't drop the ball when you when you are so close to the end, Peter Jackson. However, this trailer actually actually renewed what uh, what little faith I had uh, what little faith had diminished in the months that we had seen that we had gone through without any kind of trailer. So, yeah, the Hobbit: The Battle of the Five Armies it looks freaking awesome. 